Good morning, everybody. Oh, not morning, afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Trinity Sunday. Thanks for coming out to Alive tonight on this warm June day. Uh, just some announcements before we begin today. Um, our Juneteenth event is coming up on the 18th of June, Sunday 18th, so two Sundays from now. Galen asked me to do the Juneteenth moment for today, our Juneteenth moment. Oh, by the way, Galen is on the civil rights pilgrimage with the diocese, which is super exciting. He was down in Selma, I think, this afternoon. Uh, so that's really cool. So we're going to hopefully get a lot of cool stuff from Galen when he comes back. And hopefully an, uh, our own All Saints pilgrimage, uh, civil rights pilgrimage, which would be really sweet. Uh, so Galen has their Juneteenth moment for today. The Juneteenth flag was created in 1997. And the colors are red, white, and blue to symbolize that the free slaves were totally and truly Americans. So that's our Juneteenth moment for today. Our planning meeting is going to be this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, also at 6.45 p.m. on Tuesday is our Centering Prayer group that's on Zoom as well, too. So those both can happen. So 6.45, a Centering Prayer, and then 6, 7 o'clock is the Juneteenth planning uh, meeting. Our Love in Action t-shirts are will be in on Friday. So if you ordered one of the Love in Action t-shirts, they'll be here on Friday. If you haven't dropped off your payment, please make sure you do so this week, or you can actually put that up on PayPal. This coming Saturday, June the 10th, is New Albany Pride. It's up at BrewDog from 12 to 5 p.m. I know many of you have signed up to help volunteer for that event. We're going to have two spaces, which is going to be awesome for the Episcopal Church. Uh, so there's still places for you if you're interested in helping out. And that's from 12 to 5 on Saturday. Coming up, and you'll see it in your announcements, on July the 9th at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a team trivia night here at All Saints to help support Pelotonia. As you know, Pelotonia is that large bike race uh, that helps fight cancer. Um, it's going to be a recommended donation of about $10 per player. All proceeds will go directly to funding cancer research, which is awesome. You can bring cash that night, or we can have a donate space uh, for you on PayPal uh, for the event or you can even make a donation in advance. There will be dinner. There will be hamburgers, hot dogs, and drinks, uh, which will be provided. Uh, all kinds of questions, rounds are laid back, no buzzers or timers. Unless we're talking about Harry Potter, then I'm going to win. And that's how that'll work. Um, <laughs> you know my Harry Potter addiction. But anyone from within All Saints or outside All Saints is welcome. So tell your friends and neighbors. It's going to be a really fun night, July the 9th. You can sign up. There's going to be a volunteer link um, in your e-newsletter so we know how many people are attending. All right, let's gather our hearts and minds on this evening of Trinity Sunday as we come to worship our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Let the Son and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and with the Holy Spirit live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, and the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God said it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, 
And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser night light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the warm swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let every earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and then he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. We will now read Canticle 13 together, which is also found in your Book of Common Prayer on page 90. Glory to you, Lord, God of our fathers. You are worthy of praise, glory to you. Glory to you for the radiance of your holy name. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you in the splendor of your temple, on the throne of your majesty, glory to you. Glory to you seated between the cherubim. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you, beholding the depths. In the high vault of heaven, glory to you. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Our second reading from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord.
Lord be in your heart and on your lips, that you may worthily and fittingly proclaim his holy gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. As our custom is on a live formation Sundays, we don't have a sermon because of the teaching. And we're going to do a lot of deep teaching on the Trinity tonight. So let's sit in silence for a little while. Let the Holy Spirit percolate those readings that we just heard. And then we'll stand for the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our prayers of the people are located on Form 6, page 392 of the Book of Common Prayer. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those those who are alone, alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all all who who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, 
for the, for victims, the victims of hunger, hunger fear, injustice, injustice, and, and oppression. oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those, for those who minister, minister to the sick, the, the friendless, and, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Wayne, our bishop provisional, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all, for all who, who serve God in his church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For the sick of our parish. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Thanksgiving for the Alive Parish Formation Program. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise, and praise your, your name, name forever, forever and, ever. and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put, who put their, their trust, trust in you. Any birthdays or anniversaries we could celebrate? Come on up, Father Rick. You're it? You're it? Anyone else? Ah, oh, good. Ah, oh, anniversary. Good. When's your birthday? Ordination. Ordination. How many years? I don't know. <laughs> A lot. 76. 76 no, years. So 48. I don't know. You're well, born. I was born in 76, so it's your 48 years. Of... <laughs> How many years? Uh, 19. 19. 19. You all need to remember how many anniversaries you have. Enough. <laughs> Enough. Enough. <laughs> Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, look with love upon these, your sons and daughter, who begin another year in your name. Lord, fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit. Give them the gifts that they may carry your love to the ends of the earth. We ask all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. We pray to the Lord also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins known and unknown, things undone and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I told you you'd chant that sucker. You may be seated. Just a reminder, at the conclusion of Eucharist today, please go through those doors, grab your food, head on back to your seats. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. Notes are on your desks, on your desk, on your tables. <laughs> it's going to be a long evening. Walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God. Holy Father, great creator, source of mercy, love, and praise, 
Look upon the mediator, clothe us with his righteousness. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, through the Savior hear and bless. Holy Jesus, Lord of glory, whom angelic hosts proclaim, while we hear thy wondrous story, meet and worship in thy name. Dear Redeemer, dear Redeemer, in our hearts thy peace proclaim. Holy Spirit, sanctifier, come with unction from above. Touch our hearts with sacred fire, fill them with a Savior's love. Source of comfort, source of comfort, cheer us with the Savior's love. God the Lord through every nation, let thy wondrous mercy shine. In the song of thy salvation, every tongue and race combine. Great Jehovah, great Jehovah, form our hearts and make them thine. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people in your words spoken through the prophets and above all in the word made flesh. Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and the Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper... He took the cup of wine, 
And when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, with St. Joseph, her spouse, with St. Faustina Kowalska, whose relic reposes within this holy altar, and all of your saints. May we enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. the bread of heaven. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down before the Lord and pray for his blessing. May God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
All right, here we go. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming to our fifth and final for this year. Our, I know, right? The meat is in the mass has been our uh, theme for this uh, year's Alive Formation program. Uh, just a little teaser trailer. We will start back up in October. The first Sunday of October is our next round. October through May next year is where we're going to roll this. October through May. Uh, next year's theme is on our Christian church year, our church calendar year with some things mixed in. So that'll be a lot of fun. But between now and October, we may have a pop-up alive. You never know. Just pay attention to your flock notes and your emails. You're going to need Books of Common Prayer today, and you're going to need your um, notes that are in the middle of your tables. And we're going to dig into some meat and potatoes in regards to the Trinity, which is going to be awesome. Our theme for this last um, class is send us out in the power of the Holy Spirit which really is the prayer after communion. If you notice, we, there are two different versions of the prayer after communion in the Book of Common Prayer, which is on page 365. Most of us can say the first one by heart. You don't even need to look at your book. But I've also learned we can't say it unless we all say it together. If I asked you to say it by yourself, you probably couldn't. But if some people around you start, you probably could do it. Right? Can you say it right now by yourself? No, but if I start, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted... See, you all could do it. You all could do it, right? That's the power of communal worship, which is really, really exciting. Before I start to pontificate, I'll let those who have need books of common prayer to grab those, because we're going we're gonna to dig through the BCP a lot today. Grab your coffee, because you're going to need to be awake for this class. So we're going to begin by praying. I will say this, before we jump into this class today, a couple of prerequisites. We're going to be talking about the inner workings of an infinite and eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Most Holy Trinity. We can't do it by ourselves. Right? We need the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to deepen us. There's an old phrase... We believe to understand. We do not understand to believe. Meaning some of these eternal mysteries that we're going to be talking about today do not make any sense unless you are hooked up and connected with the Holy Spirit who is the Lord, the giver of life, and the revealer of all truth in our hearts. We can reach some of this by human reasoning, and we're going to talk about some of that but it's extremely important for us when we begin to start to understand the Trinity that we really need to have a deep relationship to the Holy Spirit who's going to enlighten us to even more. I come to find out myself, the more I pray, the more I understand. We believe to understand. If we sat here to say, I'm going to understand all this and then I'm going to believe, you're never going to believe. Because the Holy Spirit needs to enlighten our hearts. That's part of all this, along with our intellects. They both have to be present. So... Let's begin this prayer after communion together. Book of Common Prayer, page 365. And it's on top of your notes. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you notice, in that prayer that we pray every time we have the Eucharist and we ask the Lord to send us out, we talk to the whole Trinity. Father, send us out as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit. Notice the connection with the Trinity, which is why today we're going to talk about the Trinity. Now, let's dive into the creed of St. Athanasius, just for some light beginnings to this class. <laughs> Open your books of common prayer to page 864, which are the historical documents in the back. 
You notice the first two here are council documents from the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And then we have what's called commonly the Creed of St. Athanasius. One of my patrons, here's a great icon in my office given to me by Brother Athanasi, Brother Athanasios, his patron as well too. We're going to talk about St. Athanasius. This is probably composed sometime in the late 4th century. Uh, it probably wasn't written by St. Athanasius by hand, but a lot of the theology in here is embedded in his writings, which is why it's called the Creed of St. Athanasius. There's an ancient tradition in our church to read the Creed of St. Athanasius on the Feast of the Holy Trinity to help you understand the Trinity. <laughs> All right. Let's pray this together. Whosoever will be saved... Before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlasting. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreate, the Son uncreate, the Holy Ghost uncreate, the Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Ghost incomprehensible, the Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. There also there are not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated, and one incomprehensible. So likewise the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty. And yet they are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. Yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Ghost is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself, to be both God and Lord. So we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say, there be three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghost. And in this Trinity, none is a four or other, one is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. So that in all things, as it foresaid, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshiped. He therefore that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead, inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who although he be God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ. One, not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking of the manhood into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, 
rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, at whose coming all men shall rise again with their bodies and shall give account for their own works. And they that have done good shall go into everlasting life, and they that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe faithfully, he cannot be saved. Got it? Thanks for coming. <laughs> Woo! It's there. And I love it. And we're going to talk about all of those words today. Because I'm sure you understood everything you just said out loud. <laughs> we understand incomprehensible. We at that point? We at that point? Hallelujah. Yeah. We're all at that point. They're all at that point. Yes. There's a whole thing of whether that was actually in there or not. And the English compared to the Greek. That's another class, but good point. So if you didn't hear her, she was like, so St. Athanasius believed in the eternal hell. That's a whole other class, what that actually says in the original Greek. But we're not going to tackle that today. Look, Thanasi's antsy. He's like, I can do it. Nah. We're going to stick on the Trinity right now, and we will do a class on, in the fall, on heaven and Hades. All right? We'll do that. And then you can have a sidebar conversation with Brother Athanasios after this conversation. <laughs> Deal? All right. That's a lot. That's a lot. There's a story that was written in the Middle Ages about St. Augustine. St. Augustine spent his entire life trying to figure out the Trinity. And one of his famous and most beautiful works is De Trinitatis on the Trinity. And there's a story that kind of emerges late after his life. The Saint Augustine was in deep pondering, walking the beach in Carthage where he was from, walking and pondering the Trinity, and he saw a little child by the water with a seashell. And he dug a little hole in the beach, and he was watching this little kid, and he would watch as the little boy went to the big, huge Mediterranean Ocean that's there and scooped out some water and kept bringing it back to the hole and would run over and scoop out some water and put it back into the hole. And he was doing this over and over and over and over again. And St. Augustine finally came up to him and said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm going to put that whole ocean in this little hole. And Augustine said, you can't put that whole ocean in that little hole. It won't fit. And the little boy looked at him and said, neither can you understand the Trinity. <laughs> and when Augustine turned away, there was no more little boy there. So that tells you what we're ready to embark on. We are going to talk about words and concepts that the church has taken centuries to fine tune to try to continue to do what? Pass on what we've been taught by Jesus. Jesus revealed to us the Trinity. We're going to talk about this stuff. We love our Lord. We know he's risen from the dead, bodily risen from the dead. He has changed the course of human history. He has taught us and revealed us things to God. And the church holds this as precious jewels in the broken earthen vessels that we are. And because of our love for what he said to us, we'll protect it for all that we can as finite human beings trying to understand an infinite God. So even all the words that we're going to talk about tonight are straw compared to the depths of the Trinity. But God has given us an intellect and enlightened us by the Holy Spirit to begin to grasp these things that we will see, by the way, face to face when you're in his presence in eternity. This will all make sense then. But we're going to get a little appetizer on this side of the grave. Good? So if you notice, my notes are much more thick than they usually are in regards to verbiage. Because I slaved over this on the stove, cooking this thing. Making sure that my words were as precise as possible to the faith that's been handed down to us through the centuries. Well, let's talk about how the formation of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity was kind of formed in the church. All right? And we're going to, I'll probably read a little bit and then I'm going to pontificate. From the beginning, from the very beginning... The revealed truth of the Holy Trinity has been at the very root of the church's living faith. Principally, how? By means of baptism. 
And we heard this in the gospel proclaimed today. Jesus said to them in the gospel of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Here's Jesus is sometimes called the great commission, the Christ's call to evangelize. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go into the places where empire and death is found and rip it down in my name. Go bring people into this new love that has been revealed to you. Go and make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them. And then here's the Trinity. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Christ is present among us. Where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst. Christ is with us right now, enlightening your minds to the depths of the Holy Trinity. In this rule of baptismal faith that's been handed down to us by Christ, we do not have the authority to change it in any way, shape, or form. Because it's been handed down to us by our Lord himself. In this rule that he gave us, the Trinity is explicitly revealed by him and hand it on to us. St. Paul says all over the place, I hand on to you what was handed on to me. The word we, tradition that we get isn't tradition like I'm going to put candles on a cake and blow them out for your birthday. That's, that's kind of tradition, our tradition. Traditio means handing down. As Christ reveals the faith to the apostles and the early disciples, they hand it down to the next generation. They hand it down to the next generation. I have not made any... This is not me. I did not make any of this up. This is what the faith was handed down to me. Handed down from others. Handed down from others all the way back to Christ himself. Okay? The early disciples of Jesus, way back, right after the resurrection... ...formulated this expression of the Trinity in their preaching... ...in their catechesis, which means in their teaching... And in their liturgies, such formulations are already found in the apostolic writings of Paul and of Peter and the other apostles in the New Testament letters. And I use this one, which is commonly used in liturgies. And we heard it today in the second reading, by the way. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Notice the formulation there. Christ, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father... ...and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Notice the Trinity. In 2 Corinthians... ...by the way, all of the apostolic letters... ...are all written before 70. So we're talking 30 to 40 years... ...after the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus. Although the Trinity was fully manifest to us by Christ... ...the Trinity was slowly revealed to us... ...since the very beginning of creation. Did you notice the reading that we read in Mass today... ...that was about 37 minutes long... Right? The whole first chapter of Genesis, right? And you kind of zone out by day three, right? Right? Notice how it begins. And this is interesting because this is where you got to really learn Hebrew and as well as Greek. Genesis 1 1, from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Hebrew word for God is Elohim. Fun part? Elohim is plural. El is singular. Elohim created is a plural. Plural noun. But the verb is singular. Elohim bara. God created. A plural noun and a singular verb. How about them apples? In the remainder of the Old Testament, anytime you read the word Elohim speaking of the true God... It's always used with a singular verb. A plural noun and a singular verb. The conclusion to be drawn is that in some sense God is both singular and plural. The doctrine of the Trinity states that within the nature of the one God... ...there are three equal persons. Another phrase, Genesis 1.26. And then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness... And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and of all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. The phrase let us again gives the idea of plurality. The word us cannot refer to angels. And you're sometimes going to hear this. That you'll hear 
let us is God talking to all of the heavenly hosts around him. There's one problem with that. Angels can't create. And if you notice when he says, let us create in our image, humanity is not made in the image and likeness of angels, but in the image and likeness of God. So that doesn't hold a candle. I will say, I thought it was very fascinating. Rabbi Benji gave me a modern commentary on the Torah that's been used in his rabbinical school. First, I had to remember that you read it from the back to the front, because that's how things are in the Jewish world. And so I remember going back to Genesis because I wanted to see what they said here. I forgot to bring it out here, but I'll bring it out here before. But it talks about this phrase, let us. And they mention, we don't know why it's plural. It could be because of the angelic court that the Lord is presented when the world is created. However, in Christian theology, this is a clear representation of the Trinity. So in the first chapter of the Bible... We have a hint of the Trinity with the plural title Elohim, used with the singular verb, and God speaking, saying, let us. The us is there, and it could possibly be because it's the whole heavenly host that God is speaking to. But when you look at the text, angels don't create. And it's awfully interesting that the word for God is plural and the verb is singular. Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And by the way, I just gave you one glance of the Holy Spirit that is all foreshadowed all throughout the Old Testament. We can probably have one whole class on all the foreshadowings of the Old Testament images of the Trinity, which are all over the place. The word of the Lord came and the Spirit said, and you're like, oh, that's the Trinity. Anyways. This slow revealing of the Trinity, Gregory of Nazianzus, say that three times. We're going to talk about Gregory. He's one of my favorites with all this. In his Oratio Theology, that's dated somewhere between 329 and 389, which was his life. He writes this. The Old Testament proclaimed the Father clearly, but the Son more obscurely. The New Testament revealed the Son and gave us a glimpse of the divinity of the Spirit... Now the Spirit dwells among us. We just celebrated that last week with Pentecost. And gave us a clearer vision of himself. It was not prudent when the divinity of the Father had not yet been confessed to proclaim the Son openly. And when the divinity of the Son was not yet admitted to add the Holy Spirit as an extra burden. To speak somewhat daringly by advancingly and progressingly from glory to glory. The light of the Trinity will shine in ever more brilliant rays. So you can see how the Lord throughout the scriptures from the Old Testament to the present time slowly revealed one God in three persons. Now, during the first centuries of the church, especially the first 400 years, the church sought to clarify what we mean by the Trinity revealed by Christ. For what reason? To deepen our own understanding of the faith and to defend it against errors that were seeking to deform it. You know, when Jesus tells us something and someone says contrary, you correct it because you love them, right? So if someone came to you and said, Father Jason was wearing a fuchsia cassock teaching to us tonight, you would say, well, that's kind of nice, but no, he was in a black cassock tonight. One of you is right. Why? Because you were here and saw it. So when the Jesus hands down to us the understanding of the Trinity from the apostles on and on. When things deviate from the norm, the church goes, "Uh uh-uh, that's not what he taught us. That's what were happening in the first four centuries of the church. Things and people cropped up that contradicted what Christ taught us. And the church, inspired by the Holy Spirit, who Jesus gave us to defend us in all truth and to lead us in all truth, helps correct us. This clarification of the Trinity... ...was the work of early councils. Anyone know which councils? Don't look on your notes. Council of Nicaea. Council of Constantinople. And then we can talk about Ephesus. But for the most part... ...the Trinity was defined in the first two councils of Nicaea... ...and Constantinople. Which is why... ...when we profess the faith at every Eucharist... ...sometimes we mistakenly say... ...and now we profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed... When in reality, it's the Nicene-Constantinople Creed. Okay? When did these councils occur? Nicaea was held in 325. 
Constantinople was held in 381. There's a thing in our church right now that drives me bonkers. Of folks who don't want to use the creed or say the creed was given by Constantine in 325, forced upon the church to hold on to this kind of Roman law so that everyone would have to be forced to believe. That's a bunch of hooey. And especially in our modern church, we have people who write their own creeds, who refuse to save the creed, yada, yada, yada. Fact of the matter is, that's a lot of white privilege. Because... There were no white people at Nicaea. The 300 and some bishops who were present at Nicaea were all people of color from the Mediterranean basin. And all of those bishops who were present, a majority of those bishops bore on their bodies the scars of torture, made their way through Roman persecutions, were beaten, flogged, a lot of them were martyred, and these ones who were left were called confessors of the church because they would rather suffer prison and torture and exile and persecution than deny the faith that was handed on to us by Christ. So when I hear people who disparage the creed, it gets my ire up. If anything, because of those great bishops who were there, who are people of color carrying in on their bodies the persecutions against their faith. ...and their deep love that they had for Jesus Christ. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. And through the work of these great leaders and servants of Jesus... ...and sustained by the faith of the church that was around them... ...our Trinitarian faith was clarified and richly expressed. All right? What do we believe about the Trinity? Gird your loins. All right? Catechism, Book of Common Prayer, page 852... What is the Trinity? I kind of copied this here. The Trinity is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. So the first thing let's unpack is the Trinity is one. We do not confess, and you heard that in the Creed of St. Athanasius. We do not confess three gods, but one God in three persons. The divine persons of the Trinity... ...do not share the one divinity among themselves. This is called partialism. That God the Father is part divinity... ...Jesus is part divinity... ...the Holy Spirit is part divinity... ...but when you put them all together, they're one. Which means, you know, Jesus is one-third God. And the Holy Spirit is one. That's called partialism. We don't believe that. Each of them is God whole and eternal... ...and entire. Now this comes from the Council of Toledo... ...which was in 675... The Father is that which the Son is. The Son is that which the Father is. The Father and the Son is that which the Holy Spirit is. By nature, one God. One God. Got that? Let's just start foundation. Now, if you notice, in that Athanasian Creed, you heard numerous times the phrase in English, substance. Did you hear that when we read the Athanasian Creed? All of the same substance, the substance, the substance, the substance. The church specifically took the term substance. Sometimes you're going to hear essence. Other time, nature. Sometimes, and we're going to talk about why, being. Being. To designate what? The oneness of the Trinity. The unity of the Trinity. The oneness of God. In our modern Nicene Creed that we proclaim, we say we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ... The only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. And then this line, of one being with the Father. Remember saying that today? Of one being with the Father. Now, when you go to the actual Greek of the Nicene Creed, the word is homoousios. Okay? Did you get all that? Homoousios. And when it was translated into Latin, consubstantialem. Yeah, consubstantialem patri, one being with the Father. Both of them mean of the same substance. Homoousios, consubstantialem. The, believe it or not, the original Book of Common Prayer from 1549 uses the phrase being of one substance with the Father. 
It gets changed when we have the liturgical renewal of the late 70s. And so our Book of Common Prayer says, of one being with the Father. It was kind of universally said by us, the Lutherans and the Romans. The Romans just changed it in their new missal in 2002 to say, of one substance with the Father instead of being. But the word substance is used to depict the supreme reality, the nature of God, which is one. So when you hear substance, think of the oneness. Of one substance with the Father means Jesus is fully God, the Father is fully God, the Holy Spirit is fully God. All right? So the word substance equate with one or unity. Are we there? You need another meatball? We good? Okay. Now, the oneness of God is in three persons. Persons. The church uses the word person, or in the Greek, hypostasis. They're going to speak a lot of Greek tonight. It's all Greek to you tonight. Hypostasis. ...to designate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit... ...in the real distinction among them. Hypostasis in Greek means to stand by itself. It was mainly under the influence of the Cappadocian fathers... ...the great ones, Basil the Great... ...who wrote in 330 to 379. By the way, the Eucharistic prayer that we're going to start using... ...after this season, Eucharistic prayer D... ...was written by Basil. So you're going to hear the work of Basil. He was Bishop of Caesarea... His younger brother, Gregory of Nyssa, 335 to 395, was Bishop of Nyssa. And their close friend, Gregory of Nazianzus, 329 to 389. Those, that would have been a great Euchre party. I would love to be a part of that one, just to sit with all three of them and discuss the Trinity. Uh, Gregory of Nazianzus was the Patriarch of Constantinople. So all, these are three great bishops. They're the ones who help, help the term... Uh, hypostasis to come in. So they clarified there are three hypostasis differences in one usia, unity. And that's the acceptance of the orthodox understanding of the Trinity. This is what I thought is kind of interesting. This comes from Basil. The distinction between usia, oneness, and the hypostasis, difference, is the same as that between general and particular. For instance, ...between animal and a particular man or human. Wherefore, in the case of the Godhead... ...we confess one essence or substance, one usio... ...as not to give variant definition of existence... ...but we confess a particular hypostasis... ...in order that our conception of Father, Son and Holy Spirit... ...may be without confusion and clear. Now, we come from the Western Latin tradition. Latin-speaking theologians understood hypostasis... ...as substantia. That's problem. Because they were equating the difference with the oneness. And so when they were speaking of three hypostasis in the Godhead... ...some suspected that they were speaking of three substances or tritheism. Three gods. The Council of Chalcedon in 450 said, you all need to get your act together. And so instead of using hypostasis... ...the West began to use the word person. Which is why we now say... Three persons. You'll hear that more in Western Christianity than in Eastern Christianity. But what do we mean by person when we say person as Western Christians? The definition of a person is a person has intellect which to know and a will to choose. Get that? A person has intellect to know and the will to choose. A person is always someone, not something. Animals are not persons. They have intellect, but they're governed by instinct. Animals don't have free will. Only persons can have free will. Now, there are three different types of persons. There's divine persons that we talked about, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are angelic persons. Angels have an intellect and a will. Angels can choose. Some choose to serve the Lord, some not. And then there's us, human persons. God alone possesses divine nature as the divine intellect and will. Each member of the Trinity as persons has a divine intellect and a divine will separate from but in accordance with one another. Christ, the second person of the Trinity who became incarnate for us, not only has the divine intellect and will, but a human intellect and human will. He's fully God and fully human. 
Angels are persons because they know and choose, as do human beings. This is what it means to say that we are made in the image and likeness of God. We have intellect and will to choose. And our personhood images the divine personhood of the Trinity. Therefore, we believe in one God and three persons. Ooh, is your mind going out your ears now? Good, good, good. Kim? No, 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 no. Christ is the only one who assumes the human nature. It says equal. But the Father isn't human. The Son is not human. They share the Godhead together. But Christ's humanity is not shared by the Father and the Son. The Father and the Spirit. All right? It's, that's why the ascension is such a big deal, gang. Because humanity is now raised up to the level of the Godhead by Christ, who pulls us all into the Trinity. That's why the ascension is a big deal. Because it's through the incarnation that he binds himself to us, and the ascension drags us into the heart of the Godhead. But the Father did not suffer on the cross. The Holy Spirit did not suffer on the cross. Christ suffered on the cross. Drags us kicking and screaming at times. True, true. The divinity, the oneness that we talk about, the usios. The God. Sometimes you'll hear Godhead for the divinity, the oneness. Okay, good question, good question. Now, how are they relating to one another? All right. As the perfection of all that is, God, the Father's knowledge of himself is perfect. The perfect self-knowledge of the Father exists. What is the perfect knowledge of the Father? The Son. Since the Son is the perfect self-knowledge of the Father, the person of Christ has always existed, the second person of the Trinity. God the Father and God the Son have no beginning and no end, a truth acknowledged in the Nicene Creed. That's why we say begotten, not made. The love of the Father for the Son is a total self-giving. The Father empties himself completely, holding nothing back from the Son. The love of the Son for the Father is total. God the Son empties himself completely, holding nothing back from the Father. The love of the Father for the Son exists, and it is the Holy Spirit. The love that is the exchange of persons between Father and Son is the life that is the Spirit with no beginning and no end. The creed affirms that the third person of the Trinity is co-equal with and proceeds from the Father and the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and as the Son is adored and glorified. Adored and glorified is the only thing you can do to God. The love of the Holy Spirit for the other persons of the Trinity is total. The Holy Spirit empties himself completely, holding nothing back from the Father and the Son. The love of the Father and the Son for the Spirit is total. God the Father and God the Son empty themselves completely, holding nothing back from the Spirit. This exchange of persons is the inner life of the Trinity, love, pure, and simple. Before God created the world, there was love. Think of the definition, I've preached about this before, think of the definition of love. When we say love, you are automatically assuming a trinity. Love is one. But a person chooses to love. You can't love a thing. Ultimately, that love is false love. A person has to love another person. A someone, not a something. The Father, his perfect self-knowledge, the image of the invisible God, says St. Paul, is the Son. The Father fully loves the Son. The Son fully loves the Father. And the love in between them is the Holy Spirit. So when you say love, there's already three things. Someone who loves someone else and the love in between them. One, two, three. Love by itself, by its definition, is one and three. Because God is one in three persons. Woo. Yes. The love between the Father and the Son is the person of the Holy Spirit. What about our thoughts as humans? What do you mean? If you notice, we, we, made in the image of likeness of God, do that. Think of marriage. Someone who loves another one and the love in between them. Why? Because we're made in the image of a likeness of a loving God. And that's the Holy Spirit. Uh-huh. 
Ooh. Table questions. What have you learned about, knew about the Holy Trinity and what resounded with you in the most? Have a conversation at your tables and we'll pick this up in like five minutes.
let's regroup. Woo, you all are like talking like theologians. I like it. Yeah, you're trying to understand each other. Two questions that I heard amongst the floor as I was walking that I want to clarify. Someone, one table talked about a lot of times you hear God and Jesus. And is God, when we kind of hear that language, what we're really meaning is the first person of the Trinity that we call Father. And the answer is yes. So, for example, in that 2 Corinthians passage, you say um, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul is not saying that the Holy Spirit and Jesus aren't God. The word God used there really is meaning the first person of the Trinity, the Father. The Council of Nicaea... The reason the Council of Nicaea was called, there was a horrible human being named Arius who was present at the time, who was trying to tell people that Jesus was not God, that he was not fully God, that only God the Father was God. Jesus kind of gets taken up, but he is not equal to God. And the council got together. And by the way, that heresy is blatant all over the church nowadays. Because I'll have people say to me, God and Jesus. And I'm like, Jesus is God. So who are you talking about? Are you talking about the Father or the Holy Spirit? Or do you, are you an Arian? So the Council of Nicaea said that what Arius was teaching was wrong. And this is the faith that was handed to us by Jesus. Father, Son, and Spirit are God. They're, it's God. Okay. And one of the big proponents of that is St. Athanasius. And at one time, close to 85, 90% of the bishops of the world were Arian. And poor Athanasius was exiled from his uh, Episcopal see nine times because he held fast to what he believed. And people were saying to him, just give it up and join the rest of us. And his famous phrase is, then it's Athanasius against the world. And it was Athanasius who on the council floor was the one, because of his theology, that made sure the church and the Holy Spirit used him to stay in the right frame of mind. That's why the, I love the icon that um, Brother Thanasi gave me. You see Athanasius and you see all the bishops of Nicaea behind him and he's stepping on Arius. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanasi. Yeah, he was a deacon during the Council of Nicaea. So deacons, here you go, right? All right. Woo, good, good, good theology. We're diving in. Let's go a little bit more. Let's go a little bit more, all right? Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, someone said to me, well, what's the difference between Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit? And my dad thought the Holy Ghost got promoted to Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> Remember, the, the original word in Greek, spiritus, in German is geist, where we get ghost. And then during the liturgical reforms, it goes back to more of a, a, an English that says spirit, ghost and spirit literally mean the same. So if you say Holy Ghost or you say Holy Spirit, it means the same thing. So what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? Catechism, Book of Common Prayer in your back, 852. I put it already on your sheet for you. What is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. God, and I love it, because remember what we know about the Holy Spirit. The love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Love at work in the world and in the church even until now. If you notice, our outreach efforts at All Saints are now called love in action. Which is another word for the Holy Spirit. Alright? Love in action. And how do we recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives? The Catechism teaches us. We recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord... We recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit when we are brought into love and harmony with God, with ourselves, with our neighbors, and with all of creation. All right, let's unpack that. Let's unpack that, okay? The Holy Spirit is the first to awaken faith in us to confess Jesus is Lord. We heard that on the Feast of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit brings us into love and harmony with God. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. In Galatians, he writes, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
We, remember, what we pray is what we believe. When someone is baptized and they're anointed, the phrase is, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit in baptism. And you want to talk about confessing Jesus as Lord and being brought into the humanity, of, into harmony with God. When you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, you are marked as Christ's own forever. Notice that phrase, forever, forever. The knowledge of faith that we're all doing tonight is possible only in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to meet us. The Holy Spirit kindles in our hearts faith. In baptism, boy, the Holy Spirit dumps on you. Communicates to us intimately and personally the life that originates in the Father and is offered us in the Son. I love this phrase, uh, this, this quote from St. Irenaeus. He, this is coming from his teaching, demonstration of the apostolic preaching. Notice when he's writing 175. Baptism gives us the grace of new birth in God the Father through his Son in the Holy Spirit. For those who bear God's Spirit are led to the Word, that is to the Son. And the Son presents them to the Father. And the Father confers incorruptibility on them. And it is impossible to see God's Son without the Spirit. And no one can approach the Father without the Son. For the knowledge of the Father is the Son. And the knowledge of God's Son is obtained through the Holy Spirit. See how the Holy Spirit in Christ brings us into the heart of the Trinity? Through baptism? That's why we baptize as Jesus taught us to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name. St. Basil the Great, in his work on the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit we are restored to paradise. Through the Holy Spirit we are led back to the kingdom of heaven. Through the Holy Spirit, adopted as children, co-heirs with Christ, we are given confidence to call God Father and to share in Christ's grace, called children of light and given a share in the eternal glory. So the Holy Spirit is the first to give us the grace to confess Jesus is Lord. When you say Jesus is Lord, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you believe it. All right? We there? We pray in the creed, the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life. If you go to a, today is Pentecost in the Orthodox Church. And we're going to start wearing this color next week. But if you went today to a, an Orthodox Church to celebrate Pentecost, the color they wear is not red, but green. And the church is packed with greenery. Leaves everywhere. Because if you go outside today, everything is green. Well, except for the grass. All right? But the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is the giver of life. If you notice in our catechism, we say that we recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit when we're brought into love and harmony with all of creation. Tonight when we read from Genesis, we all heard, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And then I love this, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, already making it ready for life. All right? When we bless water in the Book of Common Prayer, we pray, we thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Remember, everything that we pray is scripture and the theology that's handed down to us. The Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. In the Easter blessing for the Easter vigil, when we bless water, which is one of my favorite prayers, it's really thick and rich and powerful. The priest begins to pray, Almighty God, mercifully assist us who observe this, your commandment, to baptize all nations. And of your great goodness, breathe your Holy Spirit upon us. And the priest literally breathes the sign of the cross over the water. By the word of your mouth, bless these clear waters. And I breathe again. That besides their natural virtue of cleansing the body, and I breathe again. They may by your grace cleanse our souls... And then I love it. We take the Paschal candle there. Christ on fire with the Holy Spirit descending into the water. It's like the River Jordan all over again when he was baptized. And we pray, may the power of the Holy Spirit descend into all the water of this font. And make the whole substance of this water, because water has substance, fruitful for new birth. 
the Lord, the giver of life. To be born again, you must be born again of what? Water and the Spirit. All right? We hear in Ezekiel 37, I prophesied as he commanded me. Breath, you know, this is the them bones, them bones, them dry bones. He, breath entered them. The, the word for spirit is ruha. Do you hear that breath? Ruha. The very breath of God. And those bones came to life and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By their starry host, a breath of his mouth, the Holy Spirit in creation. The Troparion for morning prayer. This is a liturgy of John Chrysostom from the East. It belongs to the Holy Spirit to rule, sanctify, and animate creation. For he is God consubstantial <laughs> with the Father and the Son. Power over life pertains to the Spirit. For being God, he preserves creation in the Father through the Son. All right? So we recognize the Holy Spirit in creation, the Lord, the giver of life. We recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit among us when we're brought into love and harmony with ourselves and each other. Cyril of Alexandria... He's writing in 373, 444, in this commentary on the Gospel of John, chapter 11. All of us who have received one and the same Spirit, is the, the Holy Spirit, are in a sense blended together with one another and with God. For if Christ, together with the Father and his own Spirit, comes to dwell in each of us, though we are many, still the Spirit is one and undivided. He binds together. The spirits of each and every one of us. And makes all appear as one in him. For just as the power of Christ's sacred flesh unites those in whom it dwells into one body. I think that in the same way the one and undivided spirit of God who dwells in all. Leads us into spiritual unity. The Holy Spirit makes us one. You ever been in the presence of the Holy Spirit? Sometimes it's the. I feel it a lot when we wash feet on Monday, Thursday. When there's that very intimate time where the Lord is washing our feet, we're washing the feet of each other, there is a spirit of love here and unity that you can't break. The spirit is making us one. When we gather for the Eucharist, the spirit is constantly making us one, not just here at All Saints, but across the church, Catholic, universal. So that's what the Book of Common Prayer says when we believe about the Holy Spirit. By the way, this is a whole semester course on the Holy Spirit. But very quickly, how does the Holy Spirit now move in the church? Love and action. How does the Spirit move in the church? Where is the Holy Spirit present among us in the church? He's in the scriptures in which he has inspired. He's in the tradition, this apostolic tradition... ...to which the church fathers are always timely witnesses. I can assure you, as I keep reading the early church fathers... ...you probably in your heart are going, wow, that's the Spirit... The Holy Spirit is present in the church when we gather for councils, like all those ecumenical councils, and even in synods, which we have in our Episcopal Church General Convention, which he assists. I love that line, he assists. One thing I've always learned about the Holy Spirit, the church has always taught about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, meaning he will not impose his will. God wants people who love him, not slaves. Oh, he's going to coax, and he will woo. But he will not impede your will. Which is why when the angel came to Mary, it was her choice to say no or not. And if she said no, none of us would be in here this morning. It's evening. Why do I keep saying morning? It's eternal morning of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit is present when we gather in the liturgy. Through its words and symbols in which he puts us in communion with Christ. The Holy Spirit is in prayer where he intercedes for us. St. Paul said, the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that we can't even understand. He is present in the charisms and in the ministries by which the church is built up. He is present in the signs of apostolic and missionary life. He is present in the witnesses of saints through whom he manifests his holiness and continues the work of salvation. And how does the Holy Spirit act in us? He prepares our hearts... And he comes to us with his grace to draw us by Christ. Yes, you made the choice to be part of Alive these five months. Yes, you made the choice and you got in your car and you made side dishes and entrees. And we came to Matt. Yes, you made that decision. But I can assure you it's because the Holy Spirit was chirping in your ear to bring you here. 
That movement to even say that you're coming was a gift and a grace of the Holy Spirit active in your lives. Yes, that's not just made up. That's our faith. The Holy Spirit in our midst makes the risen Christ known by recalling Jesus' words to us, opening our minds to understand his passion, death, and resurrection. The Holy Spirit is present among us when he makes the mystery of Christ present in the Eucharist. Notice how many times we call the Holy Spirit in the Eucharist? Especially during what's called the epiclesis, or the calling down of the Holy Spirit, right? Send forth your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. If you notice, I even with my hands, my body is, right, is expressing the Holy Spirit is coming down. In the Eastern Church, they'll take the, the chalice veil and they'll fan it like the wind over the Spirit. The Spirit comes down, making this the sacrament. And if you notice, I make the sign of the cross. And by the way, oh, by the way, you ever see my fingers like this when I bless? It's not because I'm crippled up because it's been a long day and I need, I'm dehydrated, right? You just thought about that today. You're like, what is he doing? Because normally I bless with the sign of the cross with our open hand, right? But when Jesus is now present, when the bread and wine have become his very body and blood, I sign and make the sign of the cross with his name. I C X I. Anyone know what that means, the Nasi? Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So you'll see, and this is how you bless in the Orthodox Church a little bit, right? But I see XI. I make, when Christ is now present, when the Holy Spirit comes down, this is, Jesus is here. He gets his little monogram towel, right? So I make the sign of the cross. And then if you, you hear me say, too, not only has the Spirit come down and transformed the gifts of bread and wine, sanctify us also. And you all make the sign of the cross. But if you ever notice me up here, I go like this. Do you ever see that? It's not because I'm dramatic Italian, I'm making big gestures. But the Holy Spirit is literally thick on this altar. And I'm scooping him up and smacking him on my head. So feel free to do that from your chairs. Reach out and grab him. Because the Holy Spirit is now hovering, you know, overshadowing. As he said to Mary, the power of the Holy Spirit is present here, transforming the gifts of bread and wine, and also sanctifying us. That's why you make the sign of the cross. It's because you're asking the Holy Spirit, who's now present, to sanctify this body. As he's now made for us the very body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, that our bodies may be sanctified by the Spirit and prepared for the day where we're all going to feel the resurrection. Whew. The Holy Spirit reconciles us in confession, forgiveness of sins, and brings us into communion with God. The Holy Spirit nourishes us. The Holy Spirit heals us. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit fills us with gifts and grace. The Holy Spirit gives us life. And then finally, the whole point of this class, the Holy Spirit sends us out. Remember that prayer we started with? Right? As I said, we are given two tasks by our Lord. And it's the, now the motto of our church. And that opening prayer, excuse me, the prayer after communion, but the opening of this class, if you notice, encounter Jesus, be his disciples. Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in this communion that we've all received that we are living members of his body and heirs, sons and daughters and heirs of the kingdom. That's the encounter Christ part. And now, Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, send us out to do the work you have given us to do. Be disciples to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of the risen Christ that we just encountered. To you and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Encounter Jesus, be his disciples. We can't encounter Jesus without the Holy Spirit. We can't encounter Christ and not be his disciples in the world. We need the Holy Spirit. 
We can't just be people out in the world becoming the united way with nice vestments and forgetting about Jesus who grounds us. Discipleship is both. Encounter Christ, be disciples. Woo, at your tables. <laughs> Five minutes. Where do you see the Holy Ghost at work at all saints? At your tables. Where do you see the Holy Spirit in all these different ways present in our parish and moving and guiding us? All right.
Okay, if we can gather back together. All right. Anybody want to share some of the, where they see the presence of the Spirit in our midst? Anyone want to? Just raise your hand, I'll come around with the microphone. Or somebody, we want to talk about what your table discussed. young people uh, that have gathered and that some of them are new. Great. I would say something for me is seeing the parish community take ownership over ministry and outreach and everything that we're doing. Um, yeah, yeah. Seeing that over this past year, I think has been huge. And that's definitely, I think in my eyes, a mark of the Holy Spirit's presence throughout the whole parish, is everyone coming together and, and expressing, oh, here's where I see a need. Oh, here's where I see a need. And, and folks coming together to meet that um, with one another, whether it's via, you know, different committees or just different um, volunteers or, you know, with youth ministry, parents, things like that. So. I did grin for the first time this week, and I was so emotional when I got home. I said, oh my gosh, in those three hours, we did uh, over 100 pounds of food that went to people that wouldn't have that if we weren't. And I was just very proud that our church is doing that. People that don't have, and we're giving our time, and which is nothing compared to what they go through on a daily basis. So it was just. Cool, cool. Oh, I'm coming. Oh, yeah, good. You're good. You're good. Project. There you go. Yeah, that we have good relationships with the synagogue across the street. Padre. You don't think I can project? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't hear. That's, that's a problem. Okay. Uh, I was reflecting on th that 25 years ago, we didn't exist for all practical purposes. Well, we didn't. It was me yeah. at was that you. point. It was you and her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> making phone calls. That's right. And, um, and this is very different, obviously, from where we were in year one and two and so forth. And every time that we kind of felt that we weren't quite where we ought to be, we'd make little course corrections over those years. And it, it had to be the Holy Spirit. And, yeah. and those course corrections continue uh, to this day, and, yeah. and that's just being in tune with the Spirit, and uh, if we get off kilter, the Spirit will let us know. Yeah. I yeah. When, when we were not sure we were going to ever continue, and everybody signed up to pray so many hours every day, or 15 minutes every day, whatever you could do, and it all started to turn around again, and that... True. That's true. Good, 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 good. Yeah, good job. Anybody else? Yeah. You can you can tangibly feel the Holy Spirit in this in this group every time we get together and in your leadership. Thank you. Yeah, you don't have to clap. That's all Jesus. Oh, Jerry, oh, corner to corner. This is that sermon this morning. <laughs> so back to what Rick was saying, um, there were moments when we sat and wondered, what if? And he said, I think we just have to pray. And we did, just as Nancy acknowledged. 
And the first time we met this guy, I will never forget it. We were right over there. He was standing on the side and met him, shook his hand. Rick comes up and says, what do you think of the new guy? And I said, eh, not feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> and I will never forget Rick's face. Rick absolutely just, what? <laughs> And I'm like, I don't know. And James like, I'm not sure either. And then... <laughs> <laughs> she said, let's go to lunch with him. We invited him to lunch. And immediate. But what I really want to share is that we talked at our table about how do you step out? And... and we just, we just wanted a church closer to home, which was Gehanna at the time. But something was, I, I don't know, it just, it just happened. So I, I think that the spirit is very different here. Not different, he or she is the same, but it, it calls us forward. And how fortunate to be in a congregation where things are growing and things are moving, and people are engaged. I mean, how blessed we are. So we're, we're lucky. Amen. I want to sit down. Um, I, th <laughs> I think something that's really interesting, and we probably all observe it in our own rights during Holy Week, there is a vast and intimate change that I think that happens in all of us. And something that I've noticed specifically as of late, is there are so many ministries that have been well-developed or past their kind of preschool phase, right, um, of developmentation, and, and people are plugged in. But I think what's really cool that's happening now is there are people who have been here long enough or are just starting to come or re realizing things in their own faith life and having the confidence to come forward and say, I'd like to be a part of a ministry that hasn't been established yet, or a confidence to kind of bring some of those conversations up um, and to acknowledge a need of a different generation, um, I think is really surprising and supportive. And so I'm just excited. And I guess I would hope that the church would continue to pray or think about what are the things that you lack the confidence to ask to create as a ministry here? And like, how can we continue to open that door communally? Um, we're invited into the Holy Spirit as individuals, but also together. And so we can miss out a lot of opportunities if we don't have those conversations about where we're being pulled um, by the Holy Spirit. Good point. So someone... I didn't bring it up, but even on Sunday mornings when the incense and the sunlight and you can feel and see kind of just this, you know, something's there. Yeah. And so even it's just thick in the air. Uh, yeah. There's actually a great picture of you. Do you remember that picture? It's in the hallway. We used to be in the hallway. It was on um, the Feast of the Presentation. You were reading. You were a lector. And this place was billowing with smoke. And the light was just streaming down on you. And someone on this side took a picture, and it's in the hallway. It's in the hallway. Or it's in the library. It's in the library. So I, th I think I was saying to like, our table, I think one of the big ways that the Holy Spirit moved in uh, <clears throat> our church was that during lockdown, during quarantine, there was no question that we were still church. Like, church didn't stop. Church maybe moved to Father Jason's kitchen table. <laughs> there may not have been Eucharist, but we were still church. The deacon's going to double dip. Thanks. I just had to add another one. I would just say mass, really, just mass. Um, Amy and I started coming here because a Thursday night Eucharist was offered at the time, and we couldn't make it on Sundays due to my previous job. Um, that's why we, we started coming here. Um, we stayed for the liturgy, really. We stayed for mass. And um, I think that is, I would say, uh, in some ways, unique to this parish. Um, and I really appreciate that and definitely feel the Holy Spirit's movement 
in, in our liturgy, our mass, everything. Daily office, uh, everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> cool. Thank you all. Thank you all for, A, sharing. That's a big thing about our faith, is to be able to share and talk like this and to divide in, in deep theology. And as Carolyn mentioned, I see the Holy Spirit present in each and every one of you. I mean, let's be honest. Sunday nights, when we start alive, you know, I knew by June things would dwindle down. People are busy, which is why next year we're running from October to May. You know, June's a little rough. There's a lot of graduations here. But over 200 people are engaged in this program. And you've been coming month by month, joining your small groups, coming to the level three. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit. This isn't about numbers. This isn't about how visible we are. This is about making disciples. Disciples who change the world and Christ moves among us in you. So thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your reflections and your questions. This may be our last uh, Alive One for the calendar year, but please make sure you're meeting with your small groups this month. Our level three classes will be on the Feast of St. Peter and St. Paul, which is a Thursday, the 29th. Uh, we will have a, an extra Mass on that day, on Thursday, uh, where we will have Eucharist at 12, 1 o'clock, level 3, and then 6 o'clock, uh, level 3, as well as, and then we end with Compline at 7. So we will have level 3. As I kind of mentioned last Sunday during the announcements, uh, we've been given a huge grace by the diocese to the tune of $10,000 to invest in the Alive program. Uh, we will be doing, I will be shooting all kinds of videos uh, so there are going to be videos. We're going to be able to hire a video editor who will be making videos. The flock notes that you guys have, make sure you've signed up for flock notes, either texting or email. Uh, but you're going to get more videos, quick videos, five to ten minute videos that will come out on a much more frequent basis to tie us back into the theme, to, to have formation. And then there are parishes in the diocese that want to be a part of this, especially parishes that don't have an active formation program. God bless Sam. Everyone clap for Sam. Our, our live streaming capability on YouTube, you know, that's the greatest thing about technology is we can reach so many people uh, to teach the faith, to hand on the faith. Uh, you're going to have some even guest speakers come along. Mother Trisha Lyons can't wait to be a part of this. I'm meeting with her in June about that. So she'll be helping along with a couple others, which is very exciting. So Alive is just going to get bigger and better uh, next year. Between now and October, we're going to have some pop-up things. So you'll see an announcement made. We may tackle one night with one question or something like that as we continue in the summer. Uh, but I see the Spirit present in you. Keep encountering Christ Keep being his disciples. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Pray. Uh, level 3 class, by the way, this month is going to be on the divine office that Matt mentioned. How we're constantly seeking the Holy Spirit every day to do the work that he's called us to do. How to pray the divine office. What it looks like here at All Saints. The theology behind that. That'll be level 3 class. And I'm sure our level 3 class is going to be a question and answer. What's great about this grant is all those level 3 classes will now be able to be recorded and sent out and edited and all of that good stuff. So you, more people can participate even in that class. So that's coming up there. Let's pray. Eh? One of the traditional customs on the Feast of the Trinity is to say what's called the Te Deum, or the You Are God, a great hymn of praise together to the Trinity and thanksgiving for the whole liturgical year of glory. But especially, I think, it behooves us tonight to pray it in thanksgiving for alive and these last five months uh, of this calendar year. So go to the page 95 of the Book of Common Prayer as we will recite the Te Deum together on page 95. And I think it's important for us to stand. And we'll face our Lord together. And let's say this together. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father. All creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. 
the white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great night.